uh, let's just begin this afternoon session with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Our Lady Queen of the Angels, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, so I did promise I would finish my talk from this morning. Um, and I also meant to apologize, sir. It's not very professional to sit here and give a presentation. I have an ankle injury that hasn't healed for about greatly appreciative. Um, it's been a lot of purgatory, thanks be to God. I can get some of it done here. Um, but uh, yes, it would be good to be well. So. Um, when we left off sort of talking about homology and so talking about uh, things that evolutionary biologists are comparing between one species and another and trying to say, okay, based on these uh, comparative anatomy, anatomical features, therefore I think that this species is related to that species and not to, you know, species Z over here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about vestigial organs because vestigial organs are thought to be um, sort of evolutionary leftovers. They're thought to give some more credence to this idea of common ancestry. And at one time it was thought that human beings had about 180 vestigial organs. And these were thought to be things that were kind of leftover, useless, didn't have any function in human beings, but had somehow served some kind of function in primates. And one of the most common that shows up still, even in high school biology textbooks, which is a crying shame, are tonsils and your appendix. Huh. And as an immunologist, this bothers me deeply because your tonsils and your appendix are immune tissue. They're part of your immune system and also part of your lymphoid. Uh, your tonsils, tonsils are part of your lymphoid system and they perform an important function in your body. You can survive without them, just like you can survive without your right hand. That does not mean that they do not have a function. Okay, so um, the, I'm pretty sure that a function has been found for every one of these 180 organs, <laughs> and including some more organs that we've discovered since then that also have functions. So your body is actually really functional, but this is still presented as an argument for evolution that, um, just like Mr. Owen was talking about last night with the, the lunugo, this, this coat of hair, the only thing it could be is sort of a leftover from our primate ancestry. And one of the common examples given is ostrich wings, and I, I like this example because, of course, ostrich, ostriches can't fly, and the only purpose of having wings is to fly, right? Nope. Right, guys? They're like, yes, no, maybe so. They weren't listening. Okay. They are now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so... Uh, ostriches are actually really intriguing organisms. They're, they live in, the, in uh, very arid, very hot environments, and they have a beautiful air conditioning system. And it's a network of blood vessels that's very close to the surface of their body. And as that, those blood vessels go close to the surface of their body and the air is cooler than their bodies, that actually brings cooler blood back into the core. And then at night, of course, they're going to have to be able to cover these blood vessels because otherwise they would, they would get chilled and that would be problematic. So it turns out these blood vessels are located on the underside of their wings. So when you see an ostrich sort of flutter its wings, like it does at the zoo, it's cooling itself down. It is exposing those blood vessels that are near the surface of the skin to cooler air so that cool blood can go back into the core and lower the body temperature of the ostrich so it doesn't overheat. At night in the desert, when it gets very cold, they tuck their wings up right next to them, cover up those uh, blood vessels and preserve that body heat. So ostrich wings, instead of being a vestigial useless organ, are actually a highly uh, efficient air conditioning and heating system. So this brings me to genetics, which is my favorite thing, because that's what I did for a really long time. I worked at the Genome Sequencing Center at WashU, not on the Human Genome Project, but right after that on uh, some projects that came through, including lamprey and platypus. Um, they're not, it's not really as exciting as it sounded. I never actually got to see a platypus, just a tube of DNA from a platypus. Um, <clears throat> But genetics is the new homology. So we've, we've seen that, you know, we have these structures that look homologous, but maybe they're not. Instead, we'll turn, to, we'll turn to DNA sequences, and we look at DNA sequences, and this is actually a protein sequence, but um, DNA sequences code for protein sequences. And we look and we see how many of those base pairs or how many of those amino acids are conserved across all these different species. We can come up with a much better way of classifying species. We can come up with a more clear um, tree of life. 
life. And what the got fired over was this kind of data. So it's thought, just like common structures, that common genes or genes that are shared are thought to be evidence of common ancestry. And the closer that they are um, between two species, the closer the relatedness is thought to be. So this leads us to some really interesting genetic anomalies. <laughs> You're half banana. I hope you're okay with that. I hate banana. Um, you also share the same hemoglobin found in many plants. Now this would normally suggest uh, to an evolutionary biologist that you share a close and recent ancestor with the plant. Some of my students maybe. But. Um, there's also an analysis that showed that rabbits were closer to monkeys than they were to other rodents. So they're going to redraw the tree so that rabbits are coming off of the primate branch. There was another study done same year that sea urchins are closer to vertebrates than they are to any other invertebrate. Another study that showed that cows are more related to whales than they are to horses. <clears throat> this one's my favorite. A single chain ant antigen receptor protein shows that sharks are closely related to camels. <laughs> I mean, they both have like things on their back, right? This is it. And the last one, um, bats and dolphins both have a sonar system that is almost identical on a molecular level. And all of this clearly proves that bunnies come from tomato plants. <laughs> Okay, so you get some weird things, and so this is some actual data that would have been run into by this gentleman at the Smithsonian, uh, showing that, you know, when I look at things, so I look at sharks and I say, well, sharks should be more closely related to other kinds of fish, except they share this really common trait with the mammal that lives in the desert. Um, these are the kinds of anomalies that you're going to identify, and they, ha they crop up all over the place, and that's why most animals don't actually fit into a neat, ordered tree of life. And the morphological Logical characteristics sometimes contradict the genetic characteristics. So what does all this mean? So I have a different explanation for similar structures and it includes similar genes because genes code for very tiny structures called proteins and they also have to have um, similar structures if they're going to have a similar function. So you've probably never seen these two pictures before unless you were at the Kobe retreat and you've already heard my talk. Um, but even though you've never seen these two pictures before, I guarantee you know what they are. A banana peel? A banana peel? No, not quite. They're chairs, right? How do you know they were chairs? Well, they had a place to sit, a place to put your back. That one's even got a place to put your feet. It's a little weird looking. Um, and so even though they're very strange, you can tell that they're chairs. They, all chairs are going to have a certain similarity to them because they're designed for human beings to sit down comfortably without your feet dangling above the floor, ideally, um, and support your back a little bit. So things that are similar in structure are similar in structure not because of common ancestry. These two things didn't come from the same chair. They were designed for the same purpose. Right? Wings look similar because they're made for flying. Those single chain antigen receptors in camels and sharks look similar because they're made to do the same thing. They're part of the immune system. Right? Cytochrome C, which is very similar across all kinds of different animals, in order to live in a world where there is oxygen, you have to have that protein. In order for that protein to function, it has to have a specific kind of sequence. It's not going to change very much from that because if it did, it wouldn't function. So when we look at things and we look at similarities across um, either DNA or structures, we should be thinking in terms of what's the function here? Because the function is what's driving the similarity. It's not common ancestry. Okay, I have to skip this one in the interest of time. I'm very sorry, but I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. Um, so the Miller-Urey experiment was done back in the 1950s, I believe to demonstrate how life could have arisen in a warm little pond. So this gentleman in this picture, he was younger then uh, when he did the first experiment, but <clears throat> he actually put some gases in a flask, he put a spark of lightning through them, simulate lightning, and he created amino acids. And this was hailed as like the definitive experiment that life could have come from non-living matter because amino acids are sort of on their way to becoming life. Now, we're not going to have time to go into all the problems with going from organic materials to an actual cell. That's, that's an incredibly complicated problem that hasn't been solved by anyone, biochemist or biologist. But this problem is how to go from inorganic matter to organic matter, which is an even bigger problem, it turns out,
about because what Miller um, and Yuri put in their flask was water, methane, ammonia, hydrogen gas, and carbon monoxide. And there are a couple of problems with that mixture because what we've discovered, two important things that have been discovered in geology, looking at rocks and drilling down through rocks and examining the, the um, elemental composition of rocks, is that there would have been oxygen in the early atmosphere. Now, most of you have probably never heard this before because it's, it's uh, very detrimental to evolutionary theory because if you have oxygen in that atmosphere, if you put oxygen in that flask, you don't get amino acids, you get goop. Um, that cannot have any biological function whatsoever because the amino acids continue to oxidize, they react with the oxygen, they burn basically, and they become non-biologically relevant. And another problem with this flask is that the atmosphere of primitive Earth probably wouldn't have contained any hydrogen because the hydrogen would have been too light to stay in the atmosphere in sufficient con concentrations. And if you don't put hydrogen in the flask, you don't get amino acids either. So you have oxygen, which means no amino acids. You don't have hydrogen, which means no amino acids. Two strikes, you're doubly out. So why did it work? He put the materials into his flask that he needed in order to make all of the amino acids. So you need carbon, you need hydrogen, you need nitrogen, and you need oxygen to make all amino acids except for two, which are cysteine and methionine. You also need sulfur for those. And there was no sulfur in his flask. And so it's very hard to explain, based on his experiment, how you could have gotten to a system where proteins all start with methionine, which contains sulfur, and most of them are held together by disulfide bridges between cysteines. So the very structure of proteins that we have today is not really explicable based on the Miller-Urey experiment. And I'm hitting buttons accidentally. I'm not sure how that's happening. Um, technology gremlins or something. Um, and, and just for those very nerdy science people out there, um, amino acids also are, are incorporated in your body. They're, they're you can't impose one hand over the top of the other and have it be a perfect match. They're actually mirror images. Um, amino acids are, are, work the same way. And only one of those mirror images will work in your body, not both of them. And there's never a, a protein that has a mixture. Proteins are all D-amino acids, not L-amino acids. Um, unless I said that backwards, which is possible, because if it's a true-false question, I will get it wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's all one way or the other. And there is no known non-biological mechanism to sort these out from each other. So for the first protein to sort of have arisen in a warm little pond and a rock somewhere and incorporated only one kind of chiral amino acid is pretty much impossible. Okay, that was my super fast explanation of life. So to sum up my earlier presentation, slash now presentation, evolution has failed thus far to establish that natural selection can produce anything other than variation within a kind. So giraffes produce giraffes. They might be slightly different giraffes, but they're still giraffes. It's failed to provide any evolutionary sequences that aren't full of gaps. Think back to our whales. It's failed to demonstrate the antiquity of dinosaurs or their existence before modern animals. It's failed to even define what homology is in a way that isn't completely circular. It's failed to build a tree of life, and it's failed to replicate pre-life conditions that could give rise to biological molecules, and Captain Picard is less than pleased. Okay, so moving on to part two. I'm going to talk a little bit about mutations. So if you've heard anything about evolutionary theory, you've heard about how for evolution, because evolution requires new genetic information. It requires something to be there that wasn't there before. You cannot get a man from an amoeba if you don't have an increase of genetic information. Right? The only currently identifiable source of truly new information or new variations in the genome is mutation. So there are a couple of other ways that you can mix up information that's already there, but the only way to get new stuff is for there to actually be a change in the DNA sequence. And in case you haven't taken um, high school biology in a while, I thought I would do a quick review of DNA. So DNA, um, you can think of it analogously as a set of instructions to build an organism. So your DNA contains all the instructions necessary to build you with your particular eye color, your particular hair color, your particular height, uh, although that's influenced by environment as well, um, nutrition and things like that. But you can't grow sort of past a certain size uh, based on your genetics. 
It's made of nucleotide bases, um, which we can think of as analogous to letters uh, on a page. So the individual base is the same thing as, it's as small as a letter um, <clears throat> in this, this vast amount of information, this set of instructions. And the nucleotides are arranged, I turned something off, no. The nucleotides are arranged into sequences called genes, which we can think of as, as paragraphs or chapters even um, in our information uh, here, needed to build an organism is contained in the genome, and so we can think of that as the book that we would be using as an instruction manual to build you, or to build a giraffe. I'm not obsessed with giraffes, that's the other misacker. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to imagine that the instruction manual for building a giraffe is thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of genetic information. And each giraffe has to have his own instruction manual, and giraffes did not build the printing press. So each giraffe must painstakingly copy his instruction manual from his parents. Now if you've ever painstakingly copied something by hand that's thousands of pages long, you will have done something that every other human being has done. You will have made a mistake, or two or three or four or ten, or several million. Um, <clears throat> so there's an introduction of mistakes into the instruction manual as it's copied by hand, just like there's an introduction of mistakes into the genome when it is copied by the, the cellular machinery that, that replicates DNA. So we can think of a mutation more or less as a copying error in the instructions, the codes for a living organism. So you may be wondering at this point, wait, I thought we were talking about new information, not about mistakes, and you're on to something. But we'll get there. Okay, so mutation can lead to something called speciation. Now, I was actually uh, discussing a little bit with the gentleman in the hallway about the difference between speciation and kinds. So Mr. Owen talked about uh, Noah taking all the different kinds of animals on the ark. He was not talking about him taking all the different species of animals on the ark. So we have seen the development and can see the development of individual species, which means that I've got two individuals that are no longer able to reproduce. And you can actually even see this in the domestication of the dog. So for example, the chihuahua and the Siberian Husky are not able to reproduce naturally. There's a prezygotic isolation there, so technically these two things would be considered different species, even though we know they're both dogs. This is one of the weird ways the biology... You can see over many generations, if you have a lot of copying errors, if you have one individual drifting very far away from the mean in one direction and another individual drifting very far away from the mean in another direction, eventually these two individuals are going to be so different that they can no longer reproduce and you will have a new species. So mutations can explain that, can lead to reproductive isolation. But whether mutations can explain um, molecules to man evolution is another question. And it seems more reasonable to me that if you're accumulating many, many, many mis mistakes in an instruction manual over time, you're not actually going to build a worse giraffe and gradually and gradually and gradually a worse more worse worser I don't teach English for a reason <laughs> you're going to build a worse and worse and worse giraffe until you can't build a giraffe anymore and this is a, a concept that was termed by doctor or coined by dr. John Sanford called genetic entropy and dr. John Sanford is was the inventor of the gene gun he teaches at Cornell University or at least taught at Cornell University I'm not sure if he's still teaching. Um, he's extremely well respected in the plant genetics and in the world of biology. And it wrote a whole book on this concept, this idea that mutations over time do not lead to the accumulation of new, muta of new information, but they lead to the degradation of old information. Um, if, if genetic entropy is going to be true. It can only be truly a problem if all the genetic information in the organism is useful. So I have to assume that the whole instruction manual actually codes for something important. If there are pages in the instruction manual that aren't important, they can accumulate errors and that won't affect the final outcome of building the giraffe. Does that make sense so far? Okay, because sometimes I get lost in the weeds in this particular presentation because, you know, it's my thing. All right. So for mutations to be the mechanism of evolution, four things have to be true. Right? And the first one goes along with that, that idea that's the opposite of genetic entropy. So for genetic entropy to be true, all the information has to be useful. For evolution to be true, most of the information has to actually not be useful. 
<clears throat> so it was initially thought that about 98% of your genome was useless, and so it was called junk DNA, because only about 2% of your genome is genes. The rest of it is not genes. And so we thought, well, all this stuff is not genes, it's not really doing anything, so it's junk. And then most of the changes that happen, most of the mutations that happen, need to be harmless. They need to be neutral. They need to affect the instruction manual uh, basically not at all. Some of the changes should be good. So I can't get a new organism if I don't have new information. I can't get a change that drives evolution or biology forward unless I have some beneficial mutations. And then the last thing is that as I accumulate changes, I'm going to have to lead to a new kind of animal, not just a new species of animal. So not a new giraffe um, from an old giraffe, but a new okapi from an old giraffe or something like that. Okay, very, very different kind of change. So four things have to be true. Has to be useless. Most of the information has to be useless. Most of the mutations have to be harmless. Some of them have to be good. And the accumulation has to lead to new kinds. Hold on to that because it's about to get harder. All right, so the first problem is that we're running out of useless DNA. So in code, um, which is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, is a consortium of scientists working around the world um, who are analyzing the human genome sequence that was published in the early 2000s. And what they had, um, or the information they had accumulated by the year 2012 indicated that at least 80% of your genome is functional. So that means that we've gone from 98% junk to possibly 20% junk, but probably not, because I suspect that they're still finding um, uses for these things. And they've, they've done it basically based on sequence comparison, and they're looking at things that are useful and comparing those sequences to, to things in your genome that are not genes, and they're saying, oh, hey, that looks like a regulatory element, and that looks like it, it's a, a promoter, that looks like it's an enhancer, that looks like it's doing this thing over here, it's involved in, in um, microRNA regulation. So all of these things, they're looking at, at things that they know happen in the cell, and they're saying, okay, this DNA matches DNA that does that thing. So it probably has a function, because if it, if it has a similar structure, it has a similar function, right? That's what they're basing this idea on. So this is not, um, the idea I present to you with the chairs is not a novel idea. Every biologist worth their salt knows this, but they don't apply it to evolution, <coughs> generally speaking. Okay, so a couple of specific examples because I like specific examples. Um, I was working in the Corsi lab at the Catholic University of America, and we were looking at a model organism called C. elegans. It's a tiny worm. It's about a millimeter long. It's transparent, has about a thousand cells, and they've tracked the development of every single one of those cells from the time it is a single-celled organism to the time it's an adult. It's a pretty fascinating thing to study. And what... Um, we found was that in DNA sequences, so in, in genes, genes are funny things because in, in your DNA, there, there are little interruptions in them. They're called introns. And once the DNA gets copied into RNA, those interruptions get kind of spliced out. And so these were a candidate for junk DNA when they were first discovered. Because scientists were like, well, they're not in the final, pro the final gene product. They're only in the, in the original code, so they must not be important. But we found, and when we were working with C. elegans, a regulatory site in one of those introns that was important in turning a certain gene on and off. And if that gene did not get turned on, that um, um, C. elegans could not defecate and it could not lay eggs. And this is a problem because C. elegans produce eggs even if they can't lay them, so eventually the worms would die from their offspring exploding out of their insides, which is a horrible way to go. So <clears throat> this is clearly an important region in the DNA because if there's a mutation in this one spot, in this intron that was thought to be junk, that causes this worm to die this horrible, terrible death and to be very uncomfortable in the meantime. Um, and that's what that slide was about, actually. And I'm going to skip that one, too, because it's super technical. There are other um, elements of the genome that are thought to be junk, and one candidate was pseudogenes. So pseudo means sort of, right, basically. And pseudogenes share similarities in sequence to regular genes, but they're, they're slightly different, and they don't function as genes. So they're called pseudogenes, and they were thought to be evolutionary leftovers, sort of like vestigial organs for your genome because they got copied at some point, and so then you had two copies of a gene, so one copy mutated, and it just kind of kept mutating, and it didn't really matter because it wasn't being used for anything. So it could just 
so this is thought to be evidence that some of the genome is junk. But it turns out that pseudogenes are often playing critical roles in the regulation of the genes that they resemble. So the way that they're expressed in RNA actually determines the way that the genes are expressed in the cell, and this can be important in either turning the gene on or turning the gene off. And gene regulation is a, it's a hugely important concept. It's very, very difficult to wrap your mind around, but basically you have the same information in every cell in your body, but you have, your cells are all very different. So your eye cell is different from your liver cell, and they're different because certain genes get expressed and other genes don't. Right, so this whole process of gene expression is what enables you to be a multicellular organism that has different organ systems, and you have eyes that are transparent so that light can pass through them, and a skin that is not, so we can't see your insides, which we're all very grateful for. Okay, <clears throat> so this is it's it's complicated, and I apologize for that, but it, it's hugely important. So what they're finding basically is that all these regions that were thought to be junk are actually not junk, but they're involved in this... Am I off? Is that better? No? If I reboot it, does it work? Oh, there we go. Okay. Very good. All right. I'll just shout really loudly. Um, so... All of these regions that were thought to be junk are involved in this very fine-tuned dance of what protein gets turned on when and where so that you can be a multicellular organism. So it's not junk, it's actually useful. This is a problem for evolutionary theory and a score, if you will, for genetic entropy. Okay, second problem is harmless mutations. Now, if I texted you this, you would understand what I meant, right? Uh, and you might text back something like all the time if you were involved in Steubenville retreats in the early, or late 90s or early 1000s. Um, right? If I texted you this, you would say, well, Pam Acker really needs to proofread her text before she hits send, but I still understand what she's saying. If I text you this, now you think I am uh, telling you that whatever you just said I understand, but I'm using very poor grammar. Right, and the original message is completely lost. But each of those individual mutations, so God it good or got is good, you probably would be able to get the original message from that, God is good. Right? But when I put them together, I've completely altered the message. And so this is a very simplistic example because it's only a few letters long and your DNA is three billion base pairs. But it illustrates something very important, which is I can have something that is quote-unquote harmless or neutral, but as I add together those harmless or neutral mutations, I end up with a, a very deleterious effect. I end up losing the original message. And that's actually what happens in organisms as well. And it's a big problem for organisms because natural selection, which we talked about in the last um, presentation, it only works on the level of the phenotype. This is the physical expression of the genes. So I might have a, a mutation in one of my genes that makes it work just a little bit less than my, less effectively than my neighbor. But at the level of phenotype, that doesn't really come through. It's not like I'm missing a leg. It's not like I can't run away from predators. It's not like I can't, you know, eat or something like that. So I survive. And I pass along that slightly damaged protein to my offspring. And I might even have more offspring than my neighbor. And so what happens over time is that slightly damaged protein becomes more and more prevalent in the population. And my offspring add their own mutations, which damages it just a little bit more, or damages another part of their genome a little bit more. And what gradually happens over time is these small changes that, that are not harmless or not harmful at the level of the phenotype in themselves, they accumulate over time and translate into something that is ultimately very harmful. And so... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes people twitch when I put up this graph because it's, it's not super easy to understand. But this was published um, by a gentleman named Kimura in the 80s, I believe. And he was looking at, he, he was trying to define this, these neutral mutations. And he was saying, you know, uh, there, most 
most mutations are negative. You can't even see positive mutations on this graph, by the way. <laughs> there, there are so few of them that you can't even see them. Most of them are negative. But most mutations, they're only very slightly negative, and they fall in what he called a no-selection zone. So natural selection cannot eliminate these negatives from the population. It can only eliminate really negative stuff from the population. that makes your fitness, the fitness level go way, way down. Um, it cannot eliminate these slightly deleterious mutations. And slightly deleterious is not the same as not deleterious, right? So evolutionists who argue that most mutations have no effect because they're quote unquote neutral are really pretty guilty of sleight of hand. Because if it's slightly deleterious, that doesn't mean it's neutral. And if I accumulate slightly deleterious mutations over time, I end up with something really deleterious, right? I end up eventually with. Um, well, not just a disapproving giraffe, but I end up eventually with uh, error catastrophe in my genome. I, I am no longer going to be able viable as an organism if I accumulate enough of these slightly deleterious mutations. Not, not to give you a spoiler or anything, but that is where we're headed, is error catastrophe. Okay, problem number three. Are there good mutations? So when you think of mutation, what do you think of? Godzilla. Yeah, the Godzilla, that's a great mutation. All right, um, I normally think of cancer. You might also think of, of other genes. So um, this slide is particularly poignant to me because um, those are my grandparents who both died of cancer. And below is my niece who has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, as no one else in our family has it, so it's a novel mutation in her. And she's surrounded by all of the paraphernalia per month. Everything. Um, so mutations, generally speaking, when we think about them, they're actually quite bad. They cause disease and damage and deformity. This gentleman over here has a Marfan syndrome, which means his bones are too long and he will eventually die from that. So are there good mutations? Well, obviously most of them are bad, but most evolutionary biologists will put forward the idea of antibiotic resistance as a good mutation. So an antibiotic resistance clearly seems to benefit the bacteria if there's an antibiotic present then it doesn't die. That seems like a good thing, right? But you have to look closer than just that. Because what happens when something becomes antibiotic resistance is there's a change that happens in the bacterium itself. And so with MRSA, that change happens in the peptidoglycan that crosslinks its cell wall. So normally this is a very strong linkage together. The bacterial cell wall is very stable. In MRSA, the bacterial cell wall is actually less stable. So the cross-linking doesn't, doesn't work quite as well. But that also means that the antibiotic that kills the bacteria by disrupting the cross-linking, it can't bind to that peptidoglycan. And so MRSA can survive being treated with methicillin. But if you put MRSA in a test tube with regular Staphylococcus aureus that would die in the presence of the antibiotic, the regular Staphylococcus aureus quickly outcompetes the MRSA and the MRSA goes extinct. Because the MRSA, in order to gain the ability to resist the antibiotic, has lost the ability to have solid cell walls that are the way that they're supposed to be. And so the normal bacteria is actually better suited to the environment when there's no antibiotic. And this has been repeated a number of times with different antibiotic resistances. Um, in Klebsiella bacteria, for example, they're resistant to an antibiotic that binds to the ribosome and stops protein production, but they're resistant because the ribosome has changed shape in a way that makes it work less efficiently. So if you put resistant bacteria and non-resistant bacteria together, the non-resistant bacteria will outcompete them every time. Because what's happening is it's almost like a zero-sum game, right? I can't change anything without it affecting something else. So if I have a change that allows me to resist the antibiotic, it usually affects my ability to function as a normal bacterium, and it usually makes it less. So it's a trade-off. It is not purely beneficial. I'm losing something, and that's called a fitness cost. I'm going to skip the nylonase as well because um, it's complicated. And I have five minutes left. And I know that Mr. Fitzgerald would like us to be back on time. OK, but I am going to talk about a mutation in humans, because it's not just bacteria where this happens, but it's also humans that you see a mutation leading to some kind of perceived benefit. But when you actually look at the molecule that's being mutated, it's a problem. 
So there's a CCR5 delta 32 mutation in T cell that makes T cells um, resistant to HIV infection, which sounds like a great thing, especially if you're in a high risk population for HIV. But the deletion also means that that protein cannot insert itself in the cell membrane. Now it normally belongs in the cell membrane where it performs an important function in cell signaling. If it can't get in the membrane, then HIV can't attach to it and infect the cells. But it also can't perform its normal function in cell signaling and this can lead to the development of multiple sclerosis or serious liver problems. So would you rather be resistant to HIV or not have MS? It's a trade-off. So this leads me to call this the spork problem because you can't have it both ways. You cannot be functional as a spoon and a fork at the same time. If you are antibiotic resistant, you are losing function in some other area. If you're HIV resistant, you're losing function in some other area. So these beneficial mutations are only beneficial under certain circumstances and they're very detrimental under others. So don't let anybody ever tell you there's such a I haven't found one yet. I've been looking a long time. All right, the last problem is that no matter how much mu we mutate them, bacteria are still bacteria, fruit flies are still fruit flies, finches are still finches, and peppered moths are still peppered moths. We have never seen, and bacteria are mutated at, um, I, mean, I did a calculation at one point, the number of generations that we have seen of bacteria that we've been mutating the living daylights out of in the lab, and it's astronomical, and we have still have not produced anything. We haven't even made an E. coli that is no longer an E. coli. We haven't even done speciation, let alone developed a new kind, right? And fruit flies, I think the mutation rate has been sped up like 17,000% or something like that uh, over, over 100 years because Morgan's fly room was operating in the early 1900s. Still nothing, nothing that isn't still a fruit fly. It's highly disappointing. So we're back to genetic entropy. Right? And this idea that as mutations accumulate over generations, what we're, we're, we're doing is we're losing order, we're losing function, we're losing specificity, we're getting less and less and less and less uh, perfectly human, basically. And as I accumulate these mutations, I'm headed to error catastrophe, which means that the human race will eventually go extinct. But Christ will come first, so we really don't have to probably worry about that. Too much. Okay, so the case for genetic entropy. Basically, remember, for mutations to be the driving mechanism of evolution, most of the genome has to be... It's not. It's mostly useful. Most of the mutations have to be harmless, but they're not. They're actually only slightly deleterious, but that's still deleterious. Most of, or some mutations have to be good, but even those rare ones that are claimed to be good have a fitness cost to go with them. And no matter how much we mutate something, we can't make a new kind of organism. So it seems like genetic entropy makes a lot more sense um, as the outcome of mutation than evolution would be. And there's a little bit more evidence for this because um, some recent articles have, have traced uh, supposed bacterial evolutionary lineages and shown that if those lineages are correct, genomes are actually shrinking over time instead of expanding, which is not what you would expect if you were an evolutionary biologist. You expect to be accumulating new information, but it is what you would expect if you were a creationist and you said, well, the fall happened and now we start to have mutations and now we start to lose things. This is even what you see in domestication, right? Chihuahuas are tiny because they've lost the genes to be big and they're short-haired because they've lost the genes to be long-haired. They're not short-haired because they've developed something, some sort of new gene allows them to be shorter. So I'll let Dr. Sanford sum up genetic entropy. He says that the genome is actually degenerating. It is bad news for the long-term future of the human race. It's also bad for evolutionary theory. If mutation and selection cannot preserve the information already within the genome, it's difficult to imagine how it could have created all that information in the first place. We cannot rationally speak of genome building when there's a net loss of information every generation, any more than we can rationally speak of wealth building if we're losing two cents on every transaction. So evolution fails again, fails to take into account the massive genetic differences between humans, oh sorry, that's on a different slide. It fails to establish any room for error in the genome, it fails to offer any true examples of mutations adding new information to the genome, and it fails to directly demonstrate that the accumulation of mutations leads to new organisms, and so now there are two Star Trek characters doing a face palm because this is doubly bad. And that's what I have. Yes, go ahead. What about CRISPR? CRISPR? Yes. Um, 
So method for um, altering DNA, and it's it is it's DNA scissors basically, and they've done some experiments recently in gene editing with that, and humans actually that were spectacularly uh, failures. So they were, and I'm forgetting, this came out just a few months ago, and I forget exactly who did it and what exactly disease they were trying to do, but they, they, they saw that the gene editing took place, but no recovery from the condition was actually observed in these individuals over the course of the, the time that it was um, being observed. So um, it's questionably effective as a model of gene editing but did you have a like a specific question related to that or I thought there were like three samples just most recently that were successful that's possible and I just haven't seen it pop up in my newsfeed um, but I can it, if you'd like I can give you my contact information if you if you have seen those please pass them along because I'm interested yes Talked about two scientists that uh, traced uh, mitochondrial DNA back to one man and one woman. Yes, that's actually my third talk. So if you hold that question, I will answer. I have two slides for you in my next talk. Yes, go ahead. Mike. The slow decay of genome over time philosophy reminds me of Plato's possible concept of the ages of gold, silver, and lead as the stages of humanity that decays. By any chance you take Plato during university? I did not, no. Unfortunately. Okay. Well, thank you, Pamela. That was exactly two minutes. You guys are good.